When I first started working on this uh, product, Pika Limbs, um, it's a large-ish uh, add-on. I looked uh, the other day, I catted and word counted the Python files in the project, and there's 80,000 lines of Python sitting there. Um, it was about the same size. And now in converting it, uh, retaining archetypes, because at the time I couldn't um, step over to dexterity, they said it's not ready yet. I shouldn't have listened. I should have steamed ahead, but I didn't. Um, the first thing I was told was that we need a proper listing view, because the listing view in Plone is very CMS-oriented, uh, so it does well for cut, copy, pasting documents and renaming files. But the features that we wanted, um, inline edits, and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. I'll actually go through that now. Weren't there, so this was also my first um, approach to IT uh, f programming for anyone but myself. So I was very nervous at the time. I didn't. Um, I didn't. I, I just went with the path of least resistance. I thought in the long run it would be easier, and I was wrong. Um, so I created a Beaker listing view. Okay, and this forms the core of everything in the system. It does listings of objects, it does listings of things that are not objects, it does listings of anything you can throw into a list of dictionaries. Um, and I'll take, I'll go over to the tal now, there's a, there's a lot of tal involved, but I'm just going to quickly, quickly scroll through some of these uh, class attributes here. Um, because, and I have to say this, and I've said it to a few people personally, um, when I look at other people's talks, they speak for a while, they introduce themselves, and it's, I come from here, and finally, 10 minutes or 20 minutes later, I'll see a snippet of code, and that's really what I want to see, right? And I think by the title of this talk, I can get away with saying there's code on the screen. Um, and I can give you all the feeling of um, superiority, knowing that you could do better, which is also nice. Um, because the LIMS, which is laboratory information management, can run for years and years on a single system and they can, they can have thousands of, of requests coming through and each of these can have anywhere from one to a hundred analyses done on them and then retested and retracted, there can end up being literally millions of objects in the database and they're all archetypes objects. So it, the catalogs became a little bit of a nightmare. Uh, the catalog was actually humongous and re-indexing some um, some index that lives on the analysis object, eventually you would just drop the zope. And, and I don't know exactly how they used to handle it because I started doing this. I would split the catalogs. So I have a catalog for analyses, a catalog for transactional objects like uh, worksheets, samples, and a catalog for pretty much everything else, clients and contacts. And that is the portal catalog that I use. So I have four catalogs, because I have an extra catalog for objects that live in the back end. Um, so I did notice that Plone um, sort of hard codes this idea of portal catalog everywhere. Um, and I'm in the process of switching that back. But now you will notice all of the code that I show you has got some idea of the name of the catalog that we're going to work on. Um, I, at the time also that I began here, collections were not a very nice object to work with. I thought when I first saw them that this would be a beautiful thing to subclass and build into my own work, and it wasn't so. I wasted a little bit of time there, and then I ran away. Um, so instead of using that idea, these have a content filter that, because everything obviously is meant to come from the catalog, every listing view that subclasses from here uh, has a beginning content filter that can't be changed through the UE, um, um, although it can be added to through the UE. Um, I have... Uh, inline edits in these forms, and this is a global um, flag that says no matter what th the individual field says it wants to do in this table, uh, you this table cannot edit. So after init, inside call somewhere, I might turn this on or off depending on user permissions. Um, context actions, well, uh, you, can, you always could, with a little bit of clicking, um, change the state of an object. But if you're doing content management and you have a document, you want to change the content of this document, you would probably go into the document, be working in the document, and then you would say, 
take this document and publish it for review or whatever. But if you're looking at 30 objects and you're a lab manager and they've all just arrived, they've been received downstairs and they land on your desk, you do not want to go clicking into each one and receiving. So they have this option to select the items and then go to change, um, change state and then select the state. And I'm talking about lab people. Um, they're being required to use software, but they don't want to use software. They actually want to use their old Excel spreadsheet and they've been told that they have to do this now. So um, we've got, and I'll show the, I'll bring up the table now. Um, when you select a set of items, the workflow transitions that are common between those items are single clicks at the bottom. And because that bottom space is a really nice place to say, just do something, there is no, for instance, um, duplicate to new workflow transition. So these actions is basically a hack, and you're gonna see a lot of that, to allow other actions to pretend that they're workflow actions and live alongside them. Um, which of course requires the select column. And if you turn off the select column, and I think this came straight from uh, the old blown views. If you turn off the select column, none of those actions are gonna show because you can't select anything. The select row comes from default plown. I'm not sure if it works still. There's a lot of that going on too, but this is the only time you'll see me admit it in code. Um, all right. Select all, I pretty much leave that everywhere, but there are places where it makes no sense and where people uh, make mistakes. Um, the sort column. <coughs> oh, of course, in, in ordered folders, you have that um, draggable handle. Yeah, I turned that off. I've never used that before, uh, except for ordering the items in the m m top level to change the order of the nav. Thanks. Uh, showing work for action buttons. Um, <laughs> Sometimes we want the checkbox and the select column to be turned on so that we can use these context actions, but we will have a bunch of workflow actions that are, the user has permission for, but are invoked in code somewhere, and we don't want them to appear. So we disable those and allow the manual actions to appear. Um, column toggles, uh, this is basically this entire file that I'm gonna go through here is um, th this is a celebration. The last time that I'm really going to examine this in my life before I move to Plone 5 and I'm free like a bird, yes? Um, so the column toggles, basically you can right click on a column heading and you can choose I want to see these things and each view that subclasses this will define which columns are available. Um, sure. Do you see here it says setting page size to zero specifically disables the batch size drop down. I have some sweet code, you know, wherever the, the, the batching goes on that says, well, if it's zero, um, you know, let's just let all objects appear, which is great, except that uh, there's a note you'll see in the very last uh, point release of plone.app.batching, which says if you make page size zero, you get an invalid orphan size, everything explodes, right? Okay. So I don't do that anymore. I actually set that to 999999 now. Um, the select checkbox names, well, it's called UIDs. Um, the, the, the one problem could be that um, I have multiple tables on one, multiple listings on one table. And so then all my JavaScript uh, and needs to be able to distinguish between the two. That's what I use form ID for as well. The default is list. Usually there's only one listing on a table, but quite often two or three. Review state here, um, obviously you're re referring to workflow, but default is not a workflow state. Um, in the original, let me bring up one of these tables so that we can quickly have a look and then I'll come back here. Uh, new Firefox. Um, so what this comes to is also something that I, th one of the few things that I think could be um, added to the Plone 5 views, but because Plone 5 has behaviors now, I um, won't need to play around with uh, hacking on core, I can actually do this. Um, says that when you're looking at this table, you want to maybe filter it uh, to show only objects of a particular workflow state. Um, but you also might want to show only objects of everything before the published state, uh, or you might want to show only objects that are currently editable by you or that belong to you. So that ended up being called review state, and these are my review state selectors, but they're used, basically each one of these review states, I'll get to a specific subclass now and show you, 
has um, additional fields inside its content filter that decides which objects get displayed and which not. Um, let's have a look here. How are we going? Show categories. This is another thing that I had to add. Um, that within the listings, it's possible to have a category on each item or on each dictionary that gets created from items. And that will allow the list to collapse in sort of a, an accordion so that you, you begin with a very small list and there could be 10,000 objects in there which you don't want to see all at once. Um, but obviously sometimes you do and they should all be expanded by default. Mm -hmm. Recently, because we found that um, some of these lists, uh, some of the people who behind my back have been actually using this software have um, created humongous lists of objects. Um, I've allowed these categories to expand over Ajax instead of simply hiding the objects after load. Um, more hackery for JavaScript trickery. We're not even going to go there because I honestly don't remember what it's for. Using the following attribute, some Python class may add a CSS class to the TH elements used for category headings, which allows all manner of JavaScript trickery. It is what it says it is. Um, the category index, well, I had a real problem with the... Oh, sorry, why can't I get this to go where I want it to go? I had a real problem with the, with the idea of separating the content and the category because I understand that to search through your database, you need the, the, the catalog. But I think it's been said in several talks that I've been to so far that that means you really need to know what queries are going to be done on your data in future. And with something like this um, that has grown for so long and is attempting to be generally useful to people who want to use it in so many different ways, um, you really don't ever know what kind of queries are going to be made. So in a lot of these tables, all the objects are being woken up for some reason. But if you can avoid it, um, you will say, for instance, the category index or the place that each object, the, 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 the attribute on each object is going to be scanned to see which category it belongs in. Uh, it's going to be a field index. Um, if it's not there, uh, you can you can now manually loop through the objects, waking them all up and saying, this is my category and this is my category. But if you were to provide an index here and provide an index in all of the field columns, then obviously the entire thing will use the catalog and you won't have any of that, that silly overhead. Uh, another very small thing, field icons. Oh, I'm loving this and for the first time myself, I'm looking through every addition I've made and saying a behavior, a behavior, a behavior. Um, each, each cell in that table needs to be able to have icons inserted before the text, after the text, or to have, there's, an, there's another very silly variable here. Um, I'll show you when I get to it. One to say that there could be some markup inserted before the value or after the value. Um, because the value itself could be a Boolean and I want to say yes or no. And so I'll hide it and I'll play a lot of tricky games to say to have it appear right. And you find obviously a lot of the time you end up in a place where somebody says to you, I would like you to make that item red. And it sounds very simple and they don't understand why you're charging them money for this and why you haven't finished it yet. Um, and in my case, I've um, tried to lessen that um, disparity between, you know, between their expectation and my delivery by taking shortcuts and the chickens have come home to roost. Um, so these are my column definitions. I'll let you bask in the glory of this comment for a little while. Okay. Um, all right. This is the list of possible columns that could be displayed if you were to right click on the column headers and select them, turn them on or turn them off. Again, I saw for the first time during this conference how beautifully this has been implemented in Corplone. So this is gonna disappear. Um, the one thing that they do include, um, which I'm not quite sure how it's going to be covered by behavior, is that if allow edit is turned on in one of these columns, in one of these dictionaries, then you'd be able to set the type to string boolean date choices and there might be one or two more that are not documented here, which will let people do very quick inline edits when they're looking at long lists of objects so that they don't have to lose their place, they don't have to open new tabs, and they don't have to go inside objects to edit them, uh, which then means when they come back to the table, uh, they either have to reload the table and scroll back to where they were, or they can't see where they've just edited. Um, 
I have also implemented a little filter search box, which John was showing for his Plomino app, and I saw that is implemented in the listing views in Plone Core now. So this can go away. The review state default, sure. Um, there is sort of a, a sticking point where the first review state is selected when you first land on a page, and we need to know what the default is, so okay. Here's my review states. Now, in this, in this case, I've just got one, but what I would do is I would take these columns um, and I would say, in this particular review state called ID, I'm going to show objects um, from returned by the main content filter for this table listing that are then filtered by this content filter, and the columns in that state are these. So that if you're looking at published objects, you see the date published, but if you're looking at any state before that, you don't see those columns by default. Right, so let's just push everything up and go through the whole story. Okay, some incorrect setup code because obviously these uh, default values here should be inside init and I think at least in one branch they are. Um, the comment for this is actually incorrect. Um, this is not getting the review state of any object, this is getting the review state of the form, discovering what, what state I'm in so that when a, when a request happens that requires the page to reload, the page reloads in the correct place. This table is also built um, so that it can be returned as an Ajax, uh, in, from an Ajax request, so that if it didn't exist, there's no page reload required, the table can spring into existence, and at that point also it could be reloaded inside the page and it needs to know what state it is. So there's some really wacky code here to figure that out. Um, surprisingly, all of this stuff works really well, it's just slow. Um, all of the request parameters then have to be tagged with form ID because there can be gobs of them to keep state for the entire page if there's multiple tables. Um, you see I'm using self.catalog as the string to decide which catalog I'm getting. I have a problem and this is something I'd like to um, ask you here and also all of you outside um, if you can help me figure it out. Sometimes in the request I'll receive a value and it will be my key and the value is a string. And very often, for some reason, and I cannot figure out what causes it to happen, um, I get the key and then I get a list of two identical values instead of the single value. And it, it appears random to me. So what I have spotted around the system is little checks that say, look, if I actually got a list of things, please just take the first one and pretend that that's what I got all along. Um, obviously, table only. This um, comes into effect if this is an Ajax request for the table. And then if this code is running, it can say, listen, this wasn't, this wasn't my table ID, so don't return me. Sort of like the little text files that we still have to leave inside generic setup profiles to make sure that it doesn't run on every request. All right. Okay. Now I have this idea of sorting. Um, obviously you will sort in your catalog query, but if you're looking at a list of items and not every single one of those columns has an index, you can no longer sort them. So I've got some little hacky code that's going to say, all right, fine, we're going to sort them manually. Um, sometimes this works because there aren't very many items, 10, 20, and they're just all woken up. And sometimes this works uh, via a JavaScript sort, which simply sorts the current page, which is less than useless. Um, all right, sort order. Page size, we've got this. Plone's batching wants this variable. Hmm. All right, simple enough. Now I downloaded, well, I've always used um, advanced query. I really like it. I don't understand why it was removed from Plone other than the fact that it wasn't used in Plone core, which is not much of a justification since we now have Plone API, which is maybe a little more useful included in core, although it's not used. Okay, fair enough. Um, all right, this is very boring. 
collect up all the values we need to search, collect up all the, decide which uh, type of value it is, which index we want to search on, create an OR and an AND, and append the OR conditions and the AND conditions as regular expression searches, which I don't know how to do with Z catalog at all, if it's possible. Um, and finally, we have, oh, not yet. All right, toggle calls is the thing I talked about earlier where we can now right click, and, which is a great thing, but a great mess as well. And it uses cookies to store the um, current settings, which is fine, except that it's the only cookie, the only lonely cookie in your browser for BK is this really gnarly um, each table uh, in each URL has its own set of which columns should be shown and not shown. It makes no real sense. Um, get URL. Let's have a look. Can anyone tell me what this does? An exercise for the audience. Ah, it creates, literally gets a get URL. It takes the um, request parameters, serializes them all up into a get URL, and it would then be used for something silly like um, generating a table that I want to display without, well, with, with a little bit of cheating. Um, evidence of um, history going in there. And now we have call. Now I'm going to go off to uh, one, well, I think, well, see what I want to do now is first I want to go through a little piece of showing how, uh, how, how I am so thankful for Plone 5, why I am. And then I want to go, after I'm finished here, and um, finished making myself, finished making myself um, dis expose my dirty laundry, I'm going to go to some other pieces that I would really also like to take suggestions for, things that I'm still doing that I don't know how to do in Plone. And I know that Plone is not a framework. Plone is not, I saw um, um, Dylan Jay's talk where he said, if you're making an application in Plone, you're doing it wrong. Actually, what he said was, you're stupid. But um, I disagree, uh, purely because I don't want to rewrite everything that Plone has given me. I like what Plone has given me. I just want to make my own alongside it. Um, yeah, so which categories are selected so that we can automatically expand them because we have tick boxes next to each item. When you do something that causes the page to reload or when you come into a page where a certain set of items are selected for some reason, you need those categories to be automatically expanded. Lots of circular hackery. Every time you turn around something you didn't think about, and so you continue. There's a, there's a setting in my site setup that says, um, for a particular client, these are the categories that he may not see, and for a particular client, these are the categories that will always be expanded. Um, that's just because it's a very common uh, customer request to see. These are the analyses that we do very often. We're always analyzing calcium and metals in our water, but we never really bother about E. coli. Um, and then folder items. Folder items is just responsible for, <laughs> for um, collecting up all these items and pumping them back out in a dictionary format. So um, collect up a bunch of utilities. This is another great piece of Plone API. These lumps of stuff can disappear. And run our advanced query. Make advanced query with the ors and ands we created above. Subquery, subquery, subquery. This is actually, I wish there was a reason for me to use this more, and I, I really, really think it's an amazing thing. Um, there's a few places where I've known that I could do something with a Z catalog and actually decided it's easier and it feels cleaner to just use something that um, doesn't pretend that it can't do it from the beginning. Now I enumerate brains, and for each object here, I create a results dictionary. These things are required, and as a result of the hackery of this, of the state of the union here, we have things like, um, or basically hacked into this view, we have things that are specific to a single view that subclasses this view, but there was no neat way to get them in there. So some parts of the tell have been modified, the, 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 what should be the generic tell have been modified to cater for a particular view, and some parts of this Python the same. I've tried to uh, carefully note them out here for the um, refactor, which has always been intended, but I don't think that it's very clear. 
Um, lots of junk for deciding how each item looks. I... It can all go. Right, and this actually renders the table itself, which... Um, this subclass is a table renderer from Plone somewhere, plone.app.table. Um, rendered items, I use that inside because sometimes you don't want the table elements, you're already in a table and you want to just append items. Get workflow actions is very simple. Uh, it looks pretty much like the one in, um, in DC workflow, but... I have some restrictions. Um, I would want to say in my review state uh, definitions above that certain transitions are hidden. Um, and obviously that I have some actions that I've added to this list that I um, want to appear even though they are not workflow actions. And then we come to things that have been added by people who are not me. And I... Uh, fully recognize my failings in um, updating my knowledge. I've been working with Plone 2 knowledge and I've been working in Plone 4. Um, but when other people start to do it, it's, it gets really horrific. And then this is the actual class that um, causes this to happen. And as you can see, it's not very long. It's sort of just a wrapper to make, uh, to make this Ajax ability. Now I'm going to go to one of these tables. Uh, let's try... Let's start soap first. Uh, I hope I have an, a running site. I'm never sure of the state of this database. What time do we have? We have time. Okay, while this is loading, I want to show you just one more piece of code. Um, and this is more horrific, but I have no idea how to replace it, so I feel a little bit, uh, I feel a little bit like it's justified. Um, first of all, let me start with something like this. Uh, we have, in the beginning of Beaker listing the table, we have a thing called workflow action. And when you have, uh, DC workflows have uh, before script and after script, and then also before transition event handler and after transition event handler. I am not using before and after script, I'm using the event handlers. and. That's fine when you're looking at the object inside or when you've instigated this transition using Plone's interface. But when I've come through from some other creative context, I actually need to handle that myself. So deep within this, there is some, um, there is some place where the, the action happens in one place. I'm trying not to duplicate that, but there's two paths into that place. So this workflow action, it exists in such a crazy state because I have things like... Uh, let's go here. I have things like... Let's take something embarrassing. Um, I know that when other people's code is bad, it holds my attention. I'll take analysis request. Am I here? Analysis service. Uh, I don't want to see it. Okay, let me take analysis. Okay. Oh, I think we've moved these. They live somewhere else now. Uh, in workflow, perhaps. Uh, what were they called? Transition event. I have to transition event handler. I'm going to go look for ZCML to get these out. Workflow, why can't I find it? Because it lives here. I think I'm looking at old code, guys. Yeah, I'm looking at fairly old code. Workflow is now a... All right, these are actually just the transition event handlers. So basically what they'll do is run workflow before transition and workflow script transition when the event happens. But basically now what needs to happen is I have, um, I have, we have cascading rules for these transitions. When I transition a sample from uh, waiting reception to received, um, all of the analysis requests, usually one at that point that are associated with a sample, must also go to received. Because if somebody's looking at a list of ARs, analysis requests, and they're looking at a list of samples, 
both must have the same state. So the states of the analysis request and the sample and the individual analyses inside the analysis request walk in lockstep for a point until the sample is received. Then the sample, sample stays behind and the analysis request and the analyses move together. And the analysis request will stay in the state of my sample has been received and an individual analysis will be submitted. And then it will go to waiting for verification and then it will go to verified and maybe even to published while the rest of the analyses are still sitting at a previous state. All the analyses move through individually or maybe together and when the final analysis moves through to a state above sample received, the analysis request must follow. So there's a lot of circular rules here to say, well, now that I've moved the analysis request, um, are there any batches that are attached to this analysis request that were being held back by this analysis request and they must also come forward. And once you do that, it bubbles off, it ripples out. And I don't know if there's any way or if anyone has um, had a similar affair where uh, w objects need to have their workflows dance with each other like that. So I've made a real mess about it. I do want to find it and quickly go through it. I don't, I think I have time. I ran out of time terribly yesterday. Um, jo Paul, where do we keep uh, workflow, um, workflow cascades? I'm sure it was in subscribers, so I'm gonna go look again. Ah, here, this is subscribers. That wasn't subscribers at all. No, these aren't them. These aren't them at all. These are actually subscribers. Really neat, eh? Oh, I know where they are. They're in the content objects. These subscribers called before and after. And the content objects themselves, these being some of them. Uh, let's take analysis request because I really do want to go there. Okay. <whistles> it's a schema, right? Some workflow scripts, okay. Mm. So let's take something like script receive. I'm immediately going to say, all right, um, just as a small uh, concession to performance, I've got, a, I've got a state variable kept for the duration of the request that says, look, if somebody's tried to receive this object already, don't try again. But we are peaking, so don't flag it as the attempt having happened yet. And then, if I am the first analysis request on the sample, we will now attempt to receive the sample because sometimes people will receive one or the other and it must eat, they must move together. And then we will get the analysis objects from inside of this and for each one we will attempt to receive them. It's a very simple idea, but if I go and look inside analysis now, I will see that it is attempting to make sure that its sample and its sample's analysis request are also pushed forward. And this is something that we've become petrified to touch. I'm really afraid to touch it. Every time I do something here, a month down the line, some corner of the system has broken, and then it takes me a week to fix. Um, we also have uh, some workflows that are optional, that don't always appear. And that just makes things more complicated because the, ob the objects must still walk in lockstep, but the transitions might not be there. So any object that steps out of the loop for a little while needs to be aware of this. A lot of manual coding has gone in here. This is part of why I'm really afraid to move from the plone I'm using, which would be plone 2 written in plone 4. But I think at this point I win enough that it's, 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 it deserves to happen, it's ready to happen. Um, let me go and pull into this view here if my plone has managed to start. Ah. P102, PBK, these are both old, I'm gonna go make a new one. Boom, boom. This is another thing that went wrong somewhere along the line. Not my code, wonderful code uh, came with this commit. It was a pull request written by someone. Um, Oliver Roche uh, is a pretty smart guy and he took an interest in Bika for a while, still does. And because he uses it only for Bika, 
Plone has no other purpose for him. He removed the other add-ons from that list. <laughs> and it's just another instance of Beaker not playing nice with others. We have, we have sort of, um, and I, I say we, I mean at the moment pretty much me, sort of worked myself off into a place on the corner where because I'm working with old technologies and everyone says archetypes is old and I know it's not the new and it's not the cool and no one really wants to hear about it. Um, I sort of worked myself off into a corner, like a guy who's checked out a branch and now it's got so far diverged he doesn't know how to commit it back in again. Um, yeah, this is just another symptom of that. Uh, let me get some data in here. Sorry, I should have had all this ready, but I do want to... This comes from a spreadsheet. Um, a great way to let labs load their data because they we're working in a spreadsheet to begin with. They get to format it the way I told them to, and it loads and it loads and it loads and it loads every kind of thing they can imagine. Um, I think that this will be fixed by dexterity, but what happens here is um, when these objects are being created, if I was to show each one as it was created, I'm getting something like between two and five objects a second actually being created, which is now content management speeds. This is, I think, part of why they say it's not a framework. Don't come to us with these problems. If you want your objects to be 3,000 in you know, 30 seconds, there's Postgres, there's MySQL, there's other ways for you to do that. But I still, you know, I would like to, I would like to get there. I think I will. So I'm going to go to the back end now where there's actual data. And this is my sweet, sweet control panel. Let's go to analysis services, usually the first stop. And here they are. Sweetly categorized, Ajax, they come through. Um, there's nothing editable here, um, except for things like dis disabling, disabling certain columns to get things to fit. And this is my, this is my story. So this, this duplicate here is uh, not a workflow transition. Deactivate comes from a secondary transition. And if I was to find uh, that I had active and inactive items shown here together. In fact, let me disactivate one. All right. If I was to now move to this state here, I'd see in microbiology, hello, that I have, ooh, unless I didn't deactivate him. Let's try calcium and pay attention. Uh, I think I made this code in another branch because what happens now is he's been deactivated, but if I select here, I shouldn't actually see activate. <laughs> he's already active. So that's part of the hairball. Um, yeah, you can see this is, this is, all, this is all what um, um, the, new, the new Plone theming and Rapido specifically will allow us to do these things just to walk into a view and not Rapido. But when the lab says to me, I want this particular button right here and I want it to look like that and I want it to do this, it can be done in a theme for the client and it doesn't have to infect my code like this and I can start to clean out. Um, I guess I promised code, so I'm going to go back here. Um, is there anything anyone has to teach me so far? Is there anything specific you'd like to laugh at about in my face? No, just general laughing. Okay. All right. Um, see, the concept of, of interfaces coming from a Plone 2 life where I'm still attempting to get my head around all of the things that go on, the concept of interfaces has been one of marker interfaces. That's what I understand. That's where I've gone with them so far. Um, you'll notice finally down here at the end of this file, we begin to flesh them out a little bit. It almost looks like the beginning, com the, the beginning git commit of a small project. It starts with one person making little commits with silly commit messages, and then it branches once, and then it branches twice, and then it turns into a real project. Because when we finally get down here, we have interfaces for actual dexterity types that are created that are referencing back and forth from our archetype types. And so the, 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 the porting has actually begun. Um, I'm quietly in my heart giving a round of applause of one to Power, who's actually begun that process. And it took a while and it was a lot of work. Um, I have things like query string. Oh, look, I, I, do, I, I did have sort of a, a, a line I had while I was, before I came here. 
that the title of this talk, none of, none of, none of this, not the bio, nor the titles, or was even examined by me before I got here, but the title of this talk is um, Bikalim's for Developers. Um, and I was thinking the message I have for people who have an inclination to develop Bikalim's is don't, just stay back for a month or a year and wait for me, unless you want to come and help me fix these things, because this needs to be our focus now. Um, we've come a long way. Um, <laughs> so query string was my attempt. You know query string, query string, and um, uh, all the rest of the little pieces that make up new style collections. I decided at one point, all right, that is wonderful. I am going to base these views on collections because finally I have, and it's Plone 4, get with it, and I'm going to move myself into the paradigm of Plone 4 and build collections. But of course I have everything in different catalogs. <laughs> And so that didn't work out very well. I know Nathan Van Geem has an extensive branch for allowing collections to look at different catalogs, and he never finished it. And so I don't know what made me think I could, but I thought I could at one point. So we still have some stuff lying there. Um, so yeah, that's a basic look at some very tiny pieces. We have an endless ocean of bits here, though. Um, we have a little thing, uh, I'm not sure if this is a problem still, an ID server, it's a, it's a separate running scripty designed before my time that allows a cluster in one city and a cluster in another city um, that are uh, basically the same lab. It allows them to retrieve IDs for their objects from somewhere else so that when they finally do a year-end report or when they merge data, they don't end up with the same ID from two labs. Um, with, I don't know, the the people who had the people who wrote this project, the original Plone 2 version before me, were very proud of this. Um, I'm not entirely sure why. I've turned it off. I just look at the database. I look at the catalog and add one. Um, we still have a lot of stuff in skins folders. Um, at this point, these are mostly things that I've no idea how to move out, or that are used in some clever way somewhere that. I just can't imagine removing them. I have no idea where to put guards. If anyone knows how um, how guards are meant to be located outside of the skins folder, I'd love to hear about that. Um, but this skins folder was the entirety of the project when I met it. So I, I do have to say I'm 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 here and I agreed to do this because I'm really really proud of this hairball that I've made, and I I, I wanted to show some of it off. I wanted to say when you guys see Bika. Um, and I know that I get seen in IRC asking silly questions and sometimes I try and ask really clever questions. Um, I, I, I am from Bika and I know that there is a package called Bungeni, which was a parliamentary, um, I'm not quite sure what package. There's a package in Collective that is for disaster uh, preparation and management. I'm, I'm really, it's another one, it's a very big package built in Plone and I'm not sure what it's all about. And all of these things, there's a feeling about them like, um, their customers wanted to know how to transition objects. So they went to the database, to the, to the documentation from ZOP, from the ZMI, or to create workflows, and they took that documentation and just transplanted it into their site, which is semi-valid because they were talking to their customers about their product, and their product includes the ZMI, and their customer is going to be really confused if he has to go off and read about something that he doesn't understand called ZMI. So here is this documentation. But then as a result of that, you get this feeling that there's this behemoth Semi, semi money seeking package that's open source uh, almost as an afterthought or a byproduct of what happened, and there's there's nothing happening there, and it was last updated in 2003 or whatever is going on. And when you guys see Beaker, if you see Beaker, and I'm hoping you will because it, it, it it's going to be around a while and it's going to be in Plone a while and it's going to be using Plone as a framework forever. Um, you must know that it's active and it's loved, and there are people who really. Uh, wanted to wanted to be used and turn into something, and that's happening. Um, we have a very, uh, I feel it's pretentious, idea about community. Our IRC channel has anywhere between three and fifteen people in it at any one time on Freenode, which is a compliment to our existence. Um, and it's still it it matters. If I have one guy, I had a guy come in. I had a man in IRC yesterday saying thank you. I had another man, and this doesn't happen often, the fact that it happened twice in a day is, is, it, it, it makes me feel very good, who sent a mail to the mailing list and said, English is not very good. He said, if I could applaud with three hands, I would. You guys have, yeah, that's marvelous. That's actually, that's actually what I'm here for, yeah. Um, 
What time is it? Someone must have one question for me. So um, I, my very first Bloom conference uh, was when they announced the first version of Bika Limbs in, in did Seattle in 2006. They, did they announce it at a Plone conference? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I went to, the, to, to a speech that was given by somebody. I was very excited about it. And, okay. and, and, and it was lovely to see that, it, that you were here uh, this time coming to see it. Um, I, I feel like there, there, there are answers out there for a lot of these questions that you're asking. The, the workflow one in particular, I think really? there's, there's, there's ideas of chained workflows that, 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 that CMF workflow is, is, is capable of um, that, I, that we might want to talk about at some point in time. I was about to start, okay. Yeah, there's, there's, there's good information in there. Um, I also feel like you are right, the Plone 5 thing is going to help you out a lot. Um, there, there's many places you can go with, with uh, with interfaces and the ability to show things in different ways in different places that I think are going Behaviors. to make a lot, a lot of this code just evaporate. Um, so that's that's very exciting for you. Yeah. Um, I, I'm not sure that there's even really all that much of a question in here. It's just that I'm I'm really glad to see you, you. met Beaker at inception. You it, met Beaker on plan. How many? What what year was that? Was it that was 2006? 2006 in, in Seattle. I think they had been around for a little while by then. Yeah, they had it been written fully functional system. It had been written in C. It had been written in Delphi. It had always been outsourced to some company. And uh, Lamuna, whose last coding experience, who's my boss and the other guy who I sit around with and work all day, he. Um, his last coding experience was in Fortran or something, so he tends to just let other people do the coding work. Yeah. Um, but yeah, eventually he gave it to someone and they said, hang on, you want people to log in, do workflow, have document management, let's do this in Plone. And that, that's what came back. Yeah. Anyways, thank you. That's, that's yeah, it, it, it's, it's lovely to, to see you guys out here. So yeah. that's part, of, that's, that's part of my point. That's part of the point I wanted to make was that we're, we're, we've been here all along. <laughs> we're still here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I would love to take a, a deeper look at this, but I do feel like there are some really big wins that you could find fairly quickly, um, even within the Plone 4 world, uh, looking at, 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 at some of the... I've done work in some other systems where we, we had a need for a particular type of object to appear one way in a particular context and in another way in a different context, which sounds a lot like some of the switches and filters you're doing here. Which columns do we show? Which do we not show? When do we show them? Mm -hmm. um, uh, we can do a lot of that with like adapters and interfaces and, and uh, uh, some of the little tricks that are available there. The, the biggest win I've seen so far and the thing I'm most excited about immediately is um, that dexterity allows XML, and I really don't like XML, but it has its place, and its place is much better than Python for defining schemas. I can allow yes. my customer to create a field through the web, and he doesn't get a hold of me. It makes it so much more useful for him that he doesn't have to pay someone to make this open source thing do what he wanted to do, when all he wanted was one extra column. And it says, I no longer have to be doing that work. I don't have to context switch into another project to make a field before I go back to work. Yeah. First win. Yeah. Anyway, thank you. Yeah. Questions with some, some, some comments. Um, it's really, really nice to see that other people do have the same problems <laughs> we have. Because we, I'm working for a university. Um, I was, it was a one programmer thing when I started, and I was the programmer. Um, and it was already there. So I came to the, the sinking ship of Plone 2.0 back then and uh, this is even this looks better because you use views and I mean we, we are not on views we are still on plan 2.1 and uh, we are migrating right now but um, so I, I know a lot of this <laughs> and it's really good to see that other people have the same problems there's a lot of universities who have these problems because they they have one one person who's doing all the administration and plone if he got, gets to it. Um, and it was nice to see that you already started to use dexterity in, inside your 
It's, it's happened. So it's Referenceable mixed, it's behavior. Mixable. This is one they really mix. good thing you can mix them. This is wonderful. Um, and I, you could use some more uh, documentation. More In the code. More, yeah. Right. But, but uh, on, on yes. um, it looked quite okay. But yeah. when you showed the code where you said it's from other people, this was completely undocumented. Utterly. Yeah. And so also, in my opinion, in my opinion, and I'm going to apologize in advance to the sweet man who I know is watching, and I'm not going to mention him by name. Um, yeah, there was a, there was a lot of just cargoing stuff over from Beaker Two, looking at it. Yeah, it works. So what it looks like? It looks like it looks like Plone Two, but it's working, and uh, I want to be paid now. Sorry, yeah. I'm really sorry. Um, there was something else I wanted to say, and it's gone, about this sweet Plone 5. Oh, I was going to talk now specifically about this conference and about these big wins that I can immediately get from Plone 5, immediately get from Plone 5, was that while Eric Steele was delivering the keynote speech, and he did so with such flair, um, I, I, I had a feeling that we only all stopped applauding because we thought we were being silly, but we didn't want to stop. And I had, I had a little tear in my eye. I, I'm not lying, I'm not joking. We, we're going places now. And I'm gonna, I'm, 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 I'm piggybacking all the way there. Thank you. Um, one, one small oh, thing: good. Uh, um, uh, packaging. Use, ah. use packages. If you do this and you, if you, if you rewrite a lot of this, put it into a single More packages. smaller packages. Uh, for for uh, publishing, you you want other people to use your stuff. You want to and contribute. I, mean, I don't, I don't need a limbs, but maybe I need some of your stuff that you did, and I would have to install Bika to to just use uh, your table. For example, we, so. I, I have begun once or twice. I, Jean, who's not here, traitor, um, he told me quite often. He said, if you don't participate in the community by placing your code where people can perhaps find it useful, and I know um, Zest and uh, for teamwork and so many of these companies, I use their. Um, packages. I use them and I want my little packages to be out there being used. So several times I have decided, all right, point taken and then stepped aside and th at the one issue that I'm now myopically looking at while the mountain grows around me and decided, this is beautiful. I'm going to make a little package out of this and I start with paster and I clean everything out and I realize that to create this thing, test this thing, write tests for this thing, and then step back and implement this thing I've made in my, I, I, whoa, 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 and I fix the issue and I move on to the next issue because everyone's going to get paid. But yeah. yes, I, I, agree, I, I, know, I know, thank and you. It's essentially the same uh, problem we have, but uh, we just, when we started our migration project, we sat down and we defined the development process. So there's a development process with review, with testing, tests written uh, for, uh, for a robot framework, and so the process is defined, it takes a lot longer than just fixing it. But uh, so we, we forced ourselves to, to go there, to be there, and now we can publish. Yeah. Thank you. Reinforce that. If you if if I if I if I'm back here next year and um, I meet any of you here and I haven't done so, you can hit me over the head with one of these heavy microphones and I won't I won't hold it against you. I, 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 intend to, I intend to put some things up there, and next year, one of you will look at me and say, I use that. It's going to be great. I, I want to be part of this. <laughs>